Okay, so you've made a rocket. You've made a tube. You have some sort of propellant that you're going to squirt out of the back end using a fancy Delaval nozzle. And if none of this makes any sense, you should probably go watch my first video on the physics of rocketry. And, and But there seems to be more than that, than just a tube full of fluid in a fancy nozzle at the end. There's some sort of explosion, some sort of chemistry going on, some interesting stuff happening with a rocket. And if you've ever wondered, if you've ever wondered like, hey, Robert Goddard, other pioneers, Von Braun, whatever, they were operating like, what, 100 years ago? And they came up with this device called a chemical rocket. And we've tried and explored other things, but you look at modern day rockets that are being built and designed right now and flown right now, and they're basically the same concept. I mean, they're super advanced. They're way more advanced, but it, it's based on the exact same principles. If you've ever wondered like, hey, why is that? Why aren't we living in the future? Why are rockets still behaving the same way as they were 100 years ago? It turns out that 100 years ago, we found a very potent, con uh, potent combination. We found a very powerful way to efficiently and cheaply drive rockets that we basically haven't figured out how to beat. And this very powerful combination is... Uh, because you need a propellant, because you need to squirt something out of the back through a fancy nozzle in order to get an oomph and your momentum to move your rocket around, you might as well make that propellant, whatever you're going to squirt out the back end of a rocket, you might as well make that also your energy source. Because all of this motion, if I want to take something and squirt it out the back and make my rocket, that takes energy, that costs energy. I need to extract energy from something so that I can achieve motion. Uh, last week, I gave this an e example of, of standing on the ice and you, and you throw a shoe and because of conservation of momentum, you separate, you move, you can achieve motion. That costs energy too. And I had to take the energy with me. I took the energy with me in the form of chemical potential energy by eating breakfast in the morning and then I stored that energy in my body and then I expended that energy by throwing the shoe. By the time I get myself back to the edge of the frozen lake, I'm probably going to be hungry. I'm probably, my body's telling me like, like hey, you're, you're running low on energy reserves. You should probably go have a snack. And the same is true with rockets, not the shoes and snacking part. The, the, the part about requiring energy. You need to carry a source of energy with you. And combustible fluids are incredibly dense sources of energy. They pack a lot of calories, if you will, in a very small amount of volume. So if you have some sort of fuel, like, I don't know, kerosene, in some sort of oxidizer, like, I don't know, liquid oxygen, and you keep them in two separate tanks, and then you mix them together, and ignite them, that releases a tremendous amount of energy. And that energy is more than enough to sustain the reaction. So you can just keep piling in more fuel, more liquid oxygen, more kerosene, more liquid oxygen, keep the combustion going. That energy released also transforms, it combines the chemicals, makes a new product, new chemical product that is now incredibly energetic. It's incredibly hot. So that's what you shove down into your Delaval nozzle and you can get this incredible exhaust and you can get lift off. Now, of course, there's tons of different combinations. There's different types of fuels, different kinds of oxidizers. Sometimes you don't need two fluids. You can just have one fluid that under the right conditions self-ignites, self-combusts. Sometimes it doesn't have to be liquid. It can be solid, but it's all basically the same principle. You have a source of energy and a propellant that you carry along with you in your rocket and you mix them together at just the right time to achieve thrust. Now, you might be tempted to just, if, if you want to, and, and so, and so uh, let me take a step back. Let's say you, you have a mission in mind, like, oh, I want to go to this part of the solar system or I want to lift this yay big of an object up into space, all right? And 
you know, that requires a certain amount of energy. You can calculate that energy. And let's say you just want to add like, oh, I don't, I don't want to just lift like this desk up into space. I want to lift, lift the desk and a book. I want to add a book uh, onto the desk and I want to launch that into orbit. You might be tempted in that case to just say, oh, well, okay, I add a little bit more book. Okay, I need, I'm going to need a little bit more energy. So I'll just add a little bit more fuel and that'll give me more oomph. I can just burn a little bit longer and then I'll get up into space. No problemo. Problemo. The problem here is what's called the tyranny of the rocket equation. The rocket equation is just, it's a very, very simple relationship between the energy you need to do the thing you want to do, the energy available in your fuel, and then how much of your rocket by mass is made up of that fuel. Because if you add, if you add more fuel, you're also adding more weight, which means it's more expensive to do the thing you wanted to do. So if you wanted to add a book, if you wanted to go further, you, it's not just good enough to just add the corresponding amount of fuel. You have to add a lot more fuel and this can limit what you're capable of. This can limit what you can send to orbit. This is why, one of the reasons why getting stuff to orbit is so expensive, because of this tyranny of the rocket equation it, that you have to account for the weight of of the fuel itself, which is what you're using to get yourself into space. And this means that staging is critically important. So that instead of just having one massive rocket, think about that. If, if, if you just launch one massive rocket and then you launch it and then you're halfway up, and you're halfway out of fuel, you're still, you're carrying around basically a big empty tank, like half of a tank. That's a lot, that's a lot of weight, right? Staging is important by stacking rockets on top of each other, then launching one at a time. So first the bottom rocket goes, then when it's empty, it's just an empty shell, it's just dead weight, get rid of it. Now you have a lighter object, and now that takes over, lifts up, and gives you another, give, and eventually gets your payload up into space. Staging allows you to discard parts of the rocket when they're when they're done being useful. That's why everyone's using staging because the energy that we can extract from chemical sources only so much that limits what we can do. If you want to use chemical rockets in a single stage, you're you're barely going to get anything to orbit. Like you'll get, I don't know, like an eraser up into orbit and you'll have to call it a day. If you want bigger stuff, you need to stage it. And when you think about other ways of designing rockets, like there's all these fancy ways. There's like ion drives. There's things called like Vasimir or they're like nuclear powered rockets. Uh, there's all sorts of ideas floating around out there. They're all basically the same principle. In order to make a rocket, you need to conserve momentum, which means you need a propellant. You need to squirt something out the back and you need a source of energy. You need something to do the work to do the actual squirting. So you can carry that with you in the form of a chemical rocket where your propellant and your fuel, your energy source are the same thing. In the case of an ion drive, instead of having a nozzle, or a combustion do the do the work of pushing, you have ions. You have an incredibly strong electric or magnetic field. Those can push things around. That's a force. That's just fine. Uh, there is some kinds of ion drives that are very successful. They don't give a lot of thrust because you're just... So how ion drives work, you just take like xenon, something neutral, zap it so you ionize it, and then you take those ions and drive them through a super strong electric field and push them out the back and you achieve thrust. It doesn't give you a lot of thrust. It's relatively slow, but it's very energy efficient. And, or you can pull the energy, sorry, I should say, you can pull the energy from something like the sun. You can just use solar power, which... There's plenty of sunlight up in space, easy to acquire, and sun never sets. Uh, 
there are other techniques you can say put a nuclear reactor on a rocket when nuclear reactors are kind of hot then you take your fluid your propellant run it around your nuclear reactor make it nice and hot nice and steamy and then squirt it out through your nozzle and you can achieve thrust that's never really excuse the pun taken off but you know there's some ideas out there there's more complicated concepts using you know mirrors to arrange sunlight to heat up your fluid or plasmas with very complex magnetic fields those are all difficult to do because of the extreme engineering challenges they're not necessarily possible or they're not necessarily impossible but they're very very difficult to do in practice because of things like the rocket equation where yeah okay if if you want this super fancy you know plasma toroidal magnetic field drive thing to push your spacecraft around well that's a big hunkin' chunk of stuff of metal and it's hard to get one get that up in space and then actually move it around and that requires a ton of energy where are you getting that energy it's it's these kinds of questions of what is your propellant what is your energy source how efficiently can i eject you to create thrust using that energy using that kind of propellant those are the very fundamental questions of rocketry and it's why chemical rockets are still so popular even a hundred years later. Thank you so much for watching. Please consider contributing to patreon.com slash PM Sutter. That is how I keep all of my education and outreach initiatives going. And please subscribe, watch another video, make sure notifications are turned on all the usual YouTube goodness and we'll be good and I'll see you next time.